hello and welcome to Arjen Richard Sleep, a podcast where, while carrying a little human around, I try to make a fall asleep by talking about all things cloud. Topics for this podcast will range from beginner to advanced, depending on how awake I am or how much sleep I did not get. Today's topic is going to be a foundational one, where I will talk a little bit about what is a VPC. A VPC in AWS is a virtual private cloud. Obviously, that's what the acronym stands for, because AWS loves its acronyms. But what is a VPC? A VPC is basically says in the name, sort of like a network, the own little network that you can put different kinds of resources in. Most commonly, obviously, that would be EC2 instances or databases run on RDS or similar services. Now, a VPC basically consists of different subnets. So, let's take a step back. A VPC is a network link. You give it a size defined by a side range. The side range is something you're probably familiar with, which is the four dot separated numbers that generate an IP address followed by a slash and a block size, where zero is the highest, is the biggest, and 32 is just a single IP address. In the case of a VPC, the biggest size you can get is slash 16. This offers quite a lot of IP addresses, but you don't have to worry that we'll run out of them. However, just the VPC doesn't help you in any way. To be able to use a VPC, you have to cut it up into what are known as subnets. These subnets are portions of that side range that you assign to a specific availability zone within your AWS region. Availability zone, basically a physical location that consists of one or more data centers run by AWS. Obviously, so as I said, the subnets themselves have a side range which is smaller than the one from the VPC. And you can have as many subnets as you wish. They can have different sizes. You can theoretically put them all in the same availability zone, although that would kind of defeat the purpose. Now, there are two different types of subnets. Basically, we call these public subnets and private subnets. A public subnet is directly connected to the internet through an internet gateway. Internet gateway, well, if we look at our house here, we've got an NBN box that connects it to the internet. Think of that as the internet gateway, except that the internet gateway is obviously a lot faster. So within a public subnet, if you put anything in there, it needs to get a public IP address. Otherwise, it cannot access anything on the internet, which kind of defeats the purpose of putting it in public subnet in the first place. Now, best practice is that you don't put your instances, and especially not your databases, in a public subnet. Public subnets are mostly meant just for things that need to be available directly from the internet. Think of load balancers. And as well, the other important word here, net gateways or net instances. So net gateways actually brings us to the other type of subnets, private subnets. A private subnet is a subnet that does not have a direct connection out to the internet. Instead, what it has is a connection to, for example, a net gateway. Net gateway has a transition from your private network to the public internet. So instead of connecting directly to the internet, all the traffic from private subnet will go through a net gateway or net instant in the public subnet. This means that private instances do not have their own public IP address. When they make an outbound call, they will get or it will show up as the IP address of the net instance or the net gateway. I know I've mentioned net gateways and net instances a lot interchangeably. That's basically because there are two ways to have a net happening. Net gateway is the managed service from AWS that gives you access to the outbound internet. A net instance does the same thing, but you manage the instance yourself. There are pros and cons to both solutions, but in most cases, it's easiest to just stick with the net gateway. It means you don't have to think about it, you don't have to patch the instances, it will automatically scale, and if you eventually really run into any limitations with it, you will you'll be running at such a high scale of network traffic, you will likely have or know somebody, or have somebody in your team who will be able to deal with that. Okay, so briefly go off the VPC subnets, private subnets, public subnets, but I didn't explain how 
instances know what to do. Is you can have a public, you can have a public private subnet. Some Matadas and EC2 instance in there actually know it needs to connect through in that instance to get to the outside world. For that, we've got something called route tables. Route tables are basically like a telephone book for your network. And your EC2 instances will always look at those route tables to see where to send the traffic. A route consists of a side range. So that's the range mentioned before. And the one range that's always available, that's always present in a route table is the side range of your VPC. And that's mentioned as local. That means that it always knows that, hey, if I need something within my side range, I will do it in this little network. It means they don't have to go look for it. It's all a run there. The other big one though is 0.0.0.0 slash 0, which as you can probably imagine, basically means everywhere. This is the route that you need to connect to the rest of the internet. So in a public subnet, that route will point at the internet gateway. In a private subnet, it will point to one of your net gateways. Just a tip here, make sure that you have net gateways in all of your availability zones so that the traffic doesn't have to cross to another availability zone. That always incurs extra charges. Basically, network and traffic costs in AWS are a headache. Get your head around. When you don't have much traffic, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. It won't yet be a big part of your cost. But the more data you transfer, the more those costs will grow. So, generally speaking, in a very simple setup, you would have net gateway deployed to each of your availability zones. Uh, so the public subnets in your availability zone and your private subnets will point at the relevant net gateway for that availability zone. Now, this can become all way more complex. I'm not going to go into that today. You can connect to other VPCs in various ways and you can put in things like a network firewall, which is a new service from AWS or other firewalls that run on our instances. There's plenty of vendors that offer services like that long before AWS had else. But that's more for a different day. There's two other things I just still want to mention. Both of these have to do with the connections within your network. Or rather, making sure that things can or cannot connect to each other. These are the security groups. Think of these as a firewall on your instances. For security group, you open inbound traffic and outbound traffic. This can be so you allow it from either a side range or from a different security group. For example, a common pattern I mentioned earlier, load balancers. A common pattern is that you have a security group on your load balancer that allows incoming traffic on ports 80 and 443 for HTTP traffic and HTTPS traffic, and those are the only ones you've got open, which means that no other types of traffic can be sent to it, which is exactly what you want. However, your load balancer then passes this on to your instances. To keep that as secure as possible, what you would do is open security groups on your instances only on the relevant port, which could be port 80, for example, to serve your website, but you will only open that to the security group from your load balancer. That way, that's the only traffic that goes into your instance, and you know it can only come from a load balancer. And on your load balancer, you can have extra measures like a web, web application firewall, or things like that. So there's one layer of protection. Another one are NACLs, Network ACL, Network Access Controllers, however you prefer to call them. These function a bit like security groups, but are at the subnet level instead. So you block things there in a much broader way. This way, for example, you can block access to and from different VPCs. I said I would go through it, but it is one common pattern. By default, when you create everything, these will be open. And that's not a big that's a big difference as well with security groups. There is of course a lot more to it. This was a basic overview for VPCs. As I am now lucky enough the little girl has fallen asleep, I'm going to put her back in bed and I'll speak to you all next time.